good to start the week off this week. Um, we've had quite a busy weekend, especially people in Knob and Way with this antique snowmobile show uh, going on. But it's all great to be in the Lord's house together, starting the week together in this way. Um, as most of you know, Kathy and I have a five-month-old puppy, Sadie. This is um, Kathy's photo op with Sadie. <laughs> she, you know, one Sunday I was taking a nap, and she put the blanket out and had her sit there and take pictures. Isn't she cute? Yeah, they're, they're cute for a point. Anyway, Sadie is a good puppy. Sadie is, you know, she's a puppy, and she does things, and she's good most of the time. There's things, of course, that Sadie does that aren't so good that we don't really care for and we're working on, like getting into trash. That's what we're working on right right now our trash is barricaded someplace in the house probably in the den i think and so it, she likes that i don't know why but she likes it she's a if she was an inner city ch dog she'd be a dumpster diver i'm sure anyway um she's house broke pretty well and so that's good that's you know that's good that we're on that front we're good there she also does some tricks and some things when we ask her to do some things and and by way of being obedient you know she'll she'll sit and she'll stay and as long as there aren't a lot of people in the room, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and once you get her calm down, she does pretty good with those things, and, and we're, we're thankful for that. And she does things automatically, like she prays for her food, and, and she does those things, and we're glad for all that. But not all the time. See, obedience for Sadie sometimes is pretty tough. You know, she's a puppy. She's learning. She's growing. And I think about myself. It's obedience for me in my faith walk sometimes is pretty tough. And I imagine for each one of us, it can be pretty difficult sometimes in our faith walk to be obedient to the call that Christ has put on our lives and to stay, stay true to that. This morning, we're going to move ahead in our series in this confessions, true confessions. And as a couple of reminders, one is, as every week, uh, you have a survey in your bulletin. Please um, be so kind to, after the message, fill that out, leave it lay on the pew and and um, we'll make sure to get it. If somebody, as we're getting ready for potluck, if somebody happens to pick those up, just get them to me, and we'll take care. I'll take care of them from there. Also, um, as we look to these confessions, as I've said at the beginning, we need to do so um, by setting our predisposed ideas aside and look at what the Bible says about the confessions. We want to be as biblically sound as we possibly can in our understanding. It's natural to read the scriptures through the lens that we've brought from our past, whether it's growing up in the church, whether it's um, becoming to Christ later on in life and, and someone taught you this or someone taught you that. But let's just, you know, for me, as I come up with the Anabaptist Mennonite heritage, you know, I look at these through that lens. And so I have to set that aside. I've, I've learned a lot of things, you know, that are contrary to what I, you know, I've been taught a lot of things through, this, through getting into the Word that have been contrary to what I grew up with. Not really, not really far off. Not, I mean, it wasn't so terrible or anything like that. But it's just like, well, it really doesn't say that. And so, and, and not only that, but we have to be careful how we interpret that. So we want to interpret it with the best biblical lens that we possibly can. Because you and I, or each of us individually, are going to be personally accountable with what we did with the Bible. What we did with the words, especially the words of Jesus. That was God in the flesh on earth speaking to us. So we're going to go through these confessions. And our first um, confession today will be read by Carol. And we need to get her a microphone. So would somebody please pass this to Mike to, Mike to Carol so she can be, she can be uh, heard. And, and uh, after Carol, I believe, is Tim. And after Tim comes Mike. I think you're number 13. <laughs> I'll, I'll just see what Kim says, Mike. Then. Okay, Carol, go ahead and please read this confession. We believe that the baptism of believers with water is a sign of their cleansing from sin. Baptism is also a pledge before the church of their covenant with God to walk in the way of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Believers are baptized into Christ in his body by the Spirit, water, and blood. Yeah. That's just, a, that's just a summary statement of this entire confession. I, I'm going to say up front, too, 
that some of the things that you can read up here and what they're reading are a little bit different. I didn't realize it until just this morning when we threw them up on the screen at Knobbin Way that the that summaries are different. I think they were changed at some point, and I missed the change. But they're pretty close, so it's not terrible. Um, let me also say that what we're seeing here is your salvation. I've said it before. There are, there are things that we looked at, and your salvation is contingent on what you believe about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and so on. Here we come into baptism. Your salvation is not contingent on baptism. You might say, oh, Tim, that's terrible. You know, no, it's not. Because if your salvation relied on your being baptized, it would be an issue of works at that point. We're under grace. We're under grace. We're not under works like that. It's very possible for someone to respond to the call of Jesus on their life and take him as Savior and even Lord and not be baptized. So this is not one of those non-negotiables. I mean, I think of the thief on the cross. What did Jesus tell him? Today you will be with me in paradise, right? He didn't say anything about, well, you got to get baptized first, so can we get a little bit of water up here to baptize him? He didn't say anything about that. Because we're not under works. We're under grace. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, if you would, and while we're getting there. And also, you have outlines in your, in your bulletins, so please, uh, we'll be starting with those outlines first. But Matthew chapter 3, that's the first section we're going to be coming to in the Bible. Um, now, I do want to say, while I, while I say that, there is no reason I can, um, that the, your faith, your, your salvation is contingent on baptism. I do want to say this, there's no reason that I can think of within normal living, normal lives, unless there's something, someone, someplace, and it's just strange circumstances, that I can think of, no reason I can think of that a person shouldn't be baptized or couldn't be baptized. People have, I've had people say, Tim, I can't be immersed because I've had a surgery or had this or had that. Understand, we can pour water on you. I mean, there, there are ways to get around that, okay? So, so if somebody says, well, you know, I'm not going to be baptized, and they just say, I'm not going to do it, Let's just understand that that basically is just a disobedient spirit at that, that point in time. Um, so baptism, what is baptism? Baptism is a sign that the person has repented, received forgiveness, and died to self. It's an outward sign of what's happening inside you. It's what's happening in your heart. It's a world, way for the world to see what is going on. Does it, what is this? And, then, and, and, and let me just say, Back in the reading, this confession said something, and I think it's important to hit on this. This confession said that we're baptized into Christ and his body by spirit, water, and blood. What, is, what does that mean? Now, I'm just going to touch on these things because I could, on all of these confessions, I could make a mini-series out of all of them, but we're not going to do that here. Baptism, understand, is an act of faith as well as a testimony that the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is working in your life in power. And in baptism, we're, we're, it's a public sign of saying, hey, look, I'm with Jesus. I'm on his side now. I'm on the other team. It's walking through this. It's the spirit working through you that repentance happens. We're able to walk in a new way of life, and, and we're able to walk with the community of believers in this new way of life. It's the Holy Spirit that brings people to repentance, not a spouse, not grandma and grandpa, not mom and dad, not that mean old preacher, <laughs> nobody else. Yeah, people can knock you on the head and the Holy Spirit can use people to turn you around. But ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit revealing things to us, the need to turn and to live a lifestyle of repentance. And I'll tell you what, if the Holy Spirit is working on you, he is working on you greater than any human being could ever work on you. So that's, that's by, what, by, by the sign by the Spirit. By water, we mean that we're aligning ourselves. It's kind of hard to read. We're aligning ourselves with Christ and pledging to serve Christ in others. When I get baptized with water, I'm showing the world that, that Jesus and I are on the same team, that Jesus and I are one. I'm going with Jesus. I'm aligning myself with him, and I'm going to serve him. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to serve other people by being Jesus for those people. 
as a way of following, as, a, as we follow the way of Jesus, we see that in Matthew 3, before he even started his ministry, he did something. Matthew 3, verse 13 says this. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Pretty much unannounced to John. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Basically, Jesus saying, we've got prophecy that needs to be completed here, that needs to be fulfilled here, and we're going to fulfill this here. So after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he... So that's a lowercase h, so that's talking about John. And John saw the Spirit of God descending as, as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. God the Father was happy and pleased that in obedience his Son was baptized starting his ministry in this way. It's interesting that this confession also has another part to it that reads this. Baptism is done in obedience to Jesus' command and as a public commitment to identify with Jesus Christ, not only in his baptism by water, but in his life, in the spirit, and in his death in suffering love. So by Water, we're identifying ourselves, aligning ourselves with Jesus. By, the, by blood, we understand this to mean that we're giving our life even to death. That your life doesn't matter to you anymore. That song, I lay me down, I'm not my own. Lay me down, lay me down. I belong to you alone. That's a tall order. That's a tall order. That's why, you know, there's a lot of people that take the side of, Baptize immediately and this and that, but have people counted the cost of baptism of what it really means to follow Jesus Christ? I think that's a tall order right there by itself. Jesus understood the giving of his life through the shedding of his blood and for others as a baptism. Luke twelve fifty, he said this, and talking to his disciples about what was going to happen in his future, he said this, he said, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. He understood that in going to death, it was a type of baptism. And you and I laying down our lives, even if it meant death for Jesus Christ, is a baptism that we align with him in. That's a tall order. Understand that baptism is for people who are of the age of understanding the significance of what they're doing. We used to call this the age of accountability. Anybody ever heard that term? The age of accountability. You know, and I looked it up. I can't find the age of accountability in the Bible. <laughs> you know why you can't find the age of accountability in the Bible? Because if in the Bible it said that this is the age of accountability, you know what we would do with that? We would hang all sorts of theological stuff on that oh 12 years old is the age of accountability you got to get johnny you got to get baptized you got to be 12 years old you got to do that and we would hang all we do all sorts of stuff in god's wisdom he doesn't put the age in because people mature differently people are in different seasons all the time i wasn't baptized till i was around 16 or 17 years old because i at 12 years old, when the pastor came into the room of Sunday school class in our church, remember this thing, and said, well, it's time for instruction class. <laughs> time to be baptized. And so he sat in this instruction class, and I said, you know, I'm not ready for this. I'm not. Yeah. I was the outsider, <laughs> you know. And my brothers followed suit. You know, the Miller boys, you know, I'm sure at church it was, how those Miller boys, you know, those kids, you know. <laughs> Anyway, so I think in God's wisdom, he's, he didn't put in an age. 
But it's for those people that when that person comes to take Jesus as their Savior and Lord of the life, and, and they're ready for baptism, they have counted the cost. We call this simply believer's baptism, not infant baptism. That's why we don't baptize infants. We're also being faithful to a command of Jesus when we, when we do this. Before Jesus left the earth, when he was with his disciples, one of the last commands he gave him, he said in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Understanding, for right now, for us, what we're talking about, it's important to note, he tells them to go and baptize and teach what he commanded us. Teach to live out the commands of Jesus. So baptism, oh, let me go back up. And Peter also said in Acts, he said this, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So baptism is a sign of obedience, a sign of following the command of Jesus to do what he asks of us. Next we have another article, Article 12 on the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to ask Tim to read that one, please. We believe that the Lord's Supper is a sign by which the church thankfully remembers the new covenant with Jesus Christ established by his death. In this communion meal, the members of the church renew a covenant with God and with each other. As one body, we participate in the life of Jesus Christ given for his redemption of mankind. Thus we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For some of us, what we're going through today, just like, yeah, Tim, this is a given. We should be doing this. But I think it's good to be reminded of these things, of the importance of these things. When Jesus shared this last Passover meal with his disciples, what did they do at Passover? The Passover was about remembering, wasn't it? It's about remembering the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus, coming out of slavery, the bondage of slavery into some freedom that God had planned for them. So, so it is with this Last Supper. Jesus is eating this Last Supper with the disciples. After they ate, he picks up the bread and he, he blesses it and he, and he tells them that this is my body and he, he gives the words of institution we call that today. He picks up the, the wine and does the same thing. He's t- in taking the bread and the cup at that Last Supper, Jesus was in, se- in a sense symbolic of, of him leading his disciples out of the bondage of of sin into the freedom of God and the freedom that he has for him. Jesus was kind of like being a Moses to the disciples then, wasn't he? He said, you know, we get out of this sin. We're going to leave this. We're going to leave this, take an exodus from this sin and, and go into real freedom. So this last supper, the, the, the Lord's Supper reminds us of Jesus' body. His blood was shed and the making of a new covenant with us. Remember, covenants can only be satisfied by death. And it has to be a pure, sacrificial lamb to satisfy that covenant. Jesus, being the pure, sacrificial lamb for that old covenant that God had made, was giving him, this gave him the authority to make a new covenant. Only he could make a new covenant. No other human being could do that. In fact, that was prophesied. Jeremiah talks about this in Jeremiah 31. Listen to this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Good words. 
It's come to pass through Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrificial lamb, who says, I'm going to make a new covenant. In fact, in Jesus' words to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, we see this. Paul is saying, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, a new covenant being made with us. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when or how often or how to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And, and these confessions don't tell us that either. And it's good. It's good. It didn't even tell us the frequency of it. It's good because it's up to us. Here at RCF, we celebrate open communion. And that means if you've taken Jesus to be the Savior of your life, whether you're a member or not, we welcome you to sit at the Lord's table. We're not keeping anybody away from the Lord's table. We welcome you to come to the table and dine with us as we remember, as we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Now, there's several things I believe that should be happening as we do this, as we celebrate with this meal. And that is that one is that we should remember the sacrifice. We should remember what Jesus did for us. For some of us, that brings us, makes us pretty solemn. For some of us, it makes us uh, you know, maybe a bit melancholy, bit, you know, somber, some words. For others of us, it makes us very happy. Maybe that's the roller coaster, emotional roller coaster we go on as we think about this in different ways. But we should remember the sacrifice of Christ. Another good thing to do is to be searching ourselves. Quite often, you'll see, me, you'll, you'll see in the bulletin before we have communion, I'll, I'll put in there something about we'll be having communion together, re, uh, receiving communion together. So, so let's prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves for this time. This isn't the searching ourselves to... to like the old days, the old bishops used to come and you take you in the back room and say, you know, have you sinned or whatever and confess all that stuff. We're not, we're not talking about that. No, 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 we're talking about search yourself and how are you and God doing? That's a good thing. Honestly, in this day's culture, we don't do enough of that. We, we just kind of go on with life. And so this is a time to come back and recenter and re-get back with, you know, how am I doing? But yet at the same time, be glad because the debt has been paid. You don't have to pay it. I don't have to pay it. Another thing, and that brings me to this next one, is that we need the time to celebrate the work that he's done for us. We should celebrate that thing. And notice we talk about celebrating together. That's what this is, a celebration. In celebrating the Lord's Supper, we look forward to the joy and the hope of what's to come. You know what's to come for people who are celebrating, who are redeemed? Let's take a look here. And Jesus, talking to his disciples in that last supper, he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Dropping down to 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this kind of sounds like a command, doesn't it? Okay. And in the same way, he took the cup after they eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You are, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The good news to celebrate is that one day we're going to all partake at the table of the Lord in glory. And we'll sit there together with people from every various tribe, every tribe and tongue and nation around the world, people we've never dreamed of, sitting there eating at the table of the Lord. That's good news. And that's why we celebrate, because one day we'll be there doing that very thing very thing celebrating together so communion is a sign of obedience as often as you do this remember me our next confession tends to strike fear into the hearts of many believers especially those who have not been taught about this and so michael go ahead and, and read. 
We believe that Jesus Christ calls us to serve one another in love as he did. Rather than seeking to lord it over others, we are called to follow the example of our Lord, who chose the role of a servant by washing his disciples' feet. Thanks, Mike. One of the problems people have here with when they think of washing feet is in their minds they immediately go to toe jam. <laughs> okay, let me just say, you know, if at all possible, you know, don't go to toe jam in your mind because that just makes it really tough. It'll help a lot. But seriously, <laughs> toe jam, you know, talk to me later. Okay. <laughs> This is, this is a command. You listen to Jesus' words on the day before, day before his death. One of the last things, just get this, the last words somebody speaks before they pass away generally are very important words. So one of the last words he tells his disciples is this. After he had, after he had asked, told Peter, get up, I'm going to wash your feet, and they go through that whole scenario with Peter not wanting to have his wash feet washed, and he does it anyway, and he says, I have to. He says, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, if I, the one, the one above all, the Lord, not ca- little L, big L, and teacher, capital T, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. It sounds to me like a command. It does not sound like it's, a, well, I feel good about it. That's okay. See, in this act of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, we see in Jesus, we see humility, we see service, we see love and sacrifice. He did this for his followers. This is the supreme example of servant leadership. And for verse 15, remember verse 15 back here? For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. It's interesting how a lot of Christians will latch on to things that Jesus said about this or about that. And when it comes to the issue of lowering ourselves to washing the feet of another, they gloss right over it. Jesus said that we're to do it as he did to his disciples. So, do we just pretend it's not there? It is a command. It is a call for us. We practice that here. Now, granted, some people don't feel called to do that, and, and I get that, but honestly, I'm wondering, when it comes to the words that Jesus commanded, do we have the right to say, I don't feel called to that? Sounds like a command is a command. Baptizing them, teaching them all I commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always. Yeah. Remember, we need to look at these things through the biblical view. What does the Bible say? Not what does Tim say? Not what does my back past say? But what is the Bible saying about these? If Jesus were here today, physically, standing among you, and we ask him, Jesus, of these three confessions that Tim talked about today, which is the most important? To, is it more important to... to uh, Show the world our colors by, and that, that we're aligned with you by being baptized? Or is it more important to be reminded of the sacrifice that you gave to us by partaking of the Lord's Supper? Or Jesus, is it more important of showing love for and preference to others by humbly serving each other through the act of washing a brother or sister's feet? Now, I really can't speak for Jesus very well, maybe. But I have a notion that if he were here today, because he was about serving, he was about loving, 
He was about abasing. He was about giving. He would say, you wash your feet. You do this. Because when we do those things, we're being Jesus to other people. When we do those things, you know what? Maybe if in the world we washed each other's feet a lot more, the world might get along a lot better. So washing feet, one another's feet, is a way of expressing our commitment to follow Jesus in humble service. Also, washing feet is a sign of obedience. It's what we do here. Now, baptism, the Lord's Supper, foot washing, your my salvation doesn't hang on these, but they are commanded for us to observe. Let's keep that in mind. Our dog, Sadie, she may be a work in progress. But I'll tell you this, there are times that she surprises me. There are times when she, when she instantly, without hesitation, obeys or does things, that do th- does things that's expected of her without need being told, like praying for the food. You bring your food dish down, immediately she gets down on the ground, lays flat, and she prays for her food right away. I mean, she's working on getting the head to the floor, but she does pretty good. And, and Kathy gets after her because if she's over here and praying over here, she starts creeping toward it. <laughs> but she's working. But, you know, the point is we really don't need to say pray for your food too much because she gets down. But we, we do say it. But she gets down. But when she does that, you know, it pleases me. She does things that please me. Like when she first started barking because she had to go outside, I can't tell you how pleased I was at that, you know. <laughs> it's like our kids. Our kids do things at times that please us. They do things at times that don't please us. When they do the things that don't please us, do we love them any less? No. We still love them. But when they do the things that please us without being told, without being asked, it really, it really pleases us, doesn't it? It really, really pleases us. So I wonder if that isn't how it is with our Father. When he has given us a command, especially Jesus, who has talked about obeying his commands. When we give those commands and we're, when we're obedient in those things that he asks of us, even even when our being loved or our salvation isn't hanging in the balance, we do it anyway because he's told us to. I think it really pleases him. I also believe that along with pleasing him, as a side product, is a blessing. Blessing comes with that. With obedience is blessing. So I want to encourage you, ask you to please mark your surveys today. For me, I believe all three of these are very important for us to keep track of. Let's pray. Father God.